Good morning, everybody. Um, so, I guess you hear me right too. You can even hear you via the micro. Um, my name is Alfonso Del Percho. I'm, I guess most of you know me. I'm from UCL. I am co leader with James Costa of Working Group Canon. And I have the pleasure today to present to introduce our second uh, keynote, Cécile Bigorou. As most of you know, Cécile Bigorou is Associate Professor at the Department of French at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada, where she has been teaching since 2005. Cécile has also been a visiting professor at the University of Chicago. She has taught at the University at Université Paris III and was a fellow at the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity. Working within and across the field of migration and transnationalism, globalization and colonialism, francophonie, language and economy, as well as language and labor, Cécile is very well acquainted with the social and linguistic tensions, struggles, and inequalities that are linked to new speakerism in current times of deep political and economic transformations. Through her ethnographic fieldwork in South Africa, Congo, Togo, and Benin, she has helped us challenge simplified understandings of language locality, socioeconomic inequality, and linguistic authority. She also has encouraged us to problematize the Eurocentric positionality through which we generate knowledge of language and society. In the last couple of years, I had the privilege to have Cecile as one of my main interlocutors. She has been a mentor, a colleague, and a friend. Her comments, reflections, and critiques have made me grow both academically as well as a, as a person. Cecile is one of the most inspiring and stimulating scholars that our discipline has to offer at the moment. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Cecile Bigot. Thank you so much, uh, Alfonso, for this very generous uh, uh, introduction. It's, it's very touching and uh, very touching to me. And uh, I would like to start uh, by thanking the local organizers Clara and the team, um, as well as the sponsors of the event, for uh, asking for uh, taking care of my trip from Vancouver. And uh, I also would like to thank, uh, to express my gratitude to the members of the committee on the Net, uh, New Speakers Network, especially Bernie, uh, Joanne, uh, Marilyn, um, whom I've been in contact with, uh, for inviting me to share. Um, a perspective from Sub-Saharan Africa on many of my focus today on language and migration. And I know uh, uh, some of you work uh, on this topic, so uh, I, I, I want to open a conversation with uh, issues that uh, are um, happening uh, elsewhere uh, in this world. So I feel deeply honored uh, and grateful for being given this opportunity to present uh, some of my work. So as you can, as you will see in my talk, I will bring uh, into the discussion many, many things that usually uh, don't qualify as linguistics. Uh, but I think uh, when we work on language and migration, it's very hard uh, not to have an anthropological, historical, sociological um, perspective um, on the people we work on and we work with. So bear with me, I'm not going to talk about languages at the beginning of my talk, but I did it on purpose. <laughs> so, migration is, is certainly one of the most politicized uh, topics. Uh, in the 20th and 21st centuries. And so, the discourse of... I, I, I like to walk when I talk, so that's going to be challenging. <laughs> so, uh, the discourse on migration is a big threat to national economies and one of the major causes of the rise of unemployment 
among native workers circulates very, very broadly uh, across the world, including in Africa. So the figure of migrants as economic predators and welfare-hungry parasites has been exploited by many nationalist bodies. Worth noting is that the over-politicization of migration has also shaped part of the scholarship produced on the ballot. So anyway, I was uh, talking about the over-politicization of migration and what I've been interested uh, in is how it has shaped the ways in which we think of migration and the kind of issues uh, we uh, tackle. So, um, for instance, I'm going to talk about economics and economics and people work, uh, uh, economists who work on migration, and many of them are, are, are actually labor economists, and, I, and, I, and I, I'll articulate why labor economists have been interested in, uh, in migration. Uh, in migration studies and also have tackled the issues of, of languages. So uh, when you look at the production of economists of migration, you see that they have heavily <coughs> focused uh, on whether or not migrants uh, draw on public services or represent a fiscal burden to cross societies or whether they impact on the local. And I think part of the, the reasons that most of them have worked on welfare societies, uh, where uh, this is an important, um, this is an important uh, uh, dimension. And in linguistics, a significant uh, body of work has been produced on what I call the politics of hosting and guesting, for which language plays a central role, both at an institutional level and at the small scale of interactions. So, for instance, linguists have uh, showed how the state's interpolation of people into groups based on ethnicity, race, gender, or nationality plays a crucial role in shaping the rights and duties of both the host and the guest. And I think we should always articulate you know, the two dimensions, the host and the guest at the same time. So, for instance, work done on asylum seekers in Europe, Australia, and Israel have highlighted how language has been instrumentalized by governments in order to regiment population movements. Linguists uh, have also tackled the issues of integration, for instance, through the studies of long language programs <laughs> dedicated to adult refugees or migrants or of migrant children, among many, many other, uh, many other things. So, the lingering question I've been wrestling with uh, uh, in the past few months regards the role, uh, the role played by the figure of the migrant and now that of refugee in our field. When I say in our field, I'm talking about social linguistics, uh, applied linguistics, linguistic anthropology. <coughs> And uh, when I take a step back and I look at the ways in which we have envisioned migration or migrants uh, in our work, uh, it's uh, very clear to me that we have often endorsed the 20th political construction of the migrants as the new proletarian, and I cite uh, the expression of uh, French historian Gérard Marielle. So the term migrant has become a class concept and often indexing a geographical location uh, and um, in many cases uh, uh, the global south. So the figure of migrant has enabled us to address uh, issues of race, uh, especially in Europe where the racial framing has long been erased from a scholarship. It has also enabled us to tackle the issue of social class dynamics, often without mentioning it in some part of the world, uh, notably produced in North America. But more problematically, I think, um, it has uh, also shaped our understanding of dynamics along the category of thoughts imposed by the state, the first one being the dichotomy between migrants and locals. And, and I think the African continent forces us to rethink many of the factors on which this dichotomy is based. For instance, the socio-economic minority versus majority that migrants and locals respectively embody in the global north 
doesn't apply in many African countries where the majority of its population lives in social economic precarity. The language issues relating to migrants' access to the labor market are posed very differently in countries where the majority of the population is disempowered linguistically, having to function in a language most of the time uh, a former colonial language, <coughs> French, uh, English or Portuguese, whose legitimate varieties are out of reach to the majority. So, in my presentation I want to shift the lenses of analysis by focusing on some research questions associated with South-to-South -South migrations within Africa and discussing it from the perspective of Sub-Saharan Africa. So I want to use Africa here as a vantage point in order to bring into visibility phenomena that may be otherwise overlooked. And I think many of the uh, questions are, that I'm going to raise are questions that actually are posed also in the European context, but we tend to uh, overlook these questions. So, an analysis of migration within Africa is relevant for the following reasons, one of them uh, being demographic. According to the United Nations 2030, the scale of south to south migration is similar to that of south to north, respectively 36% and 35%. And I wanted to uh, give you a, a clearer picture. Uh, as you can see, I mean, it's, it's not very obvious, but in Africa, 80% of African uh, migrants move within the continent, either by relocating from rural to urban environments or transnationally, often to neighboring countries. So these figures tend to challenge the grand narrative on African migrations produced in the global north by disputing ideologically loaded ideas about African countries as predominantly sending countries and Africans as all aspiring to the greener pastures of the global north. Such framing is fostered by and feeds European and North American nationalist ideas of discourse, whose ideological apparatus draw its inspiration, inspiration from a long legacy of racialized and racist discourse. This state of affairs from scholars of migration, I think, to be very cautious by making sure that our research agenda are driven by sound empirical and theoretical questions emerging from the ground rather than uh, by policy-driven agendas. These agendas explain in part the imbalance in the production of knowledge of international migration and contribute to the distorted image of African migration broadcasted by the media and exploited by politicians of the global north. The over-representation of research on South to North migration, I think, is also a consequence of the little interest funding agencies of the North displaying projects on migration that do not directly impact European or North American societies. And very few African countries or African higher institutions have the resources and infrastructure to invest in research. So therefore, we should remain aware of the crucial role funding agencies play in the production of knowledge by enabling or hindering research agendas and questions, and by extension in our collective understanding of migrations in this particular case. So, without undermining the quality and importance of the research question addressed in the scholarship on South to North migration, I believe that its focus has led scholars to frame migration issues that don't account for the diversity of migrants and host populations' experiences around the world. For instance, the colonial post colonial relationships between sending and receiving countries, the racial approach to account for social political tensions between migrant and source population, or the ways in which allogloats challenge the nation-state's ideology of multilingualism and social cultural cohesiveness, like in Europe, tend to be removed from the sub-Saharan uh, ecology I'm, I'm going to discuss in my presentation. More fundamentally, 
the question I wish to raise here and the accounts I provide are aimed to remind us that the linguistic notions in currency in our research area and the practices and ideology they seek to describe were typically born out of language dynamics in the European and North American context. I believe this notion do not invalidate our findings if we consider them as a province of our knowledge rather than as a globalizing explanatory account of the only lens through which other situations must be explained. And by province of our knowledge, I allude to Shaq Fabati's 2000 idea of provincializing Europe as expressed in the following quotation. Sorry, provincializing Europe begins and ends by acknowledging the indispensability of European political thought to representation of non-European political modernity and yet struggles with the problem of representations that this indispensability invariably creates. As a matter of fact, one can't but notice that despite its long tradition, the scholarship on intracontinental African migration has hardly influenced the research paradigm and issues arising from what tends to be a heterogeneous field of migration and transnational studies. I think it reflects the ideological construct of the world into distinctive evolutionary poles that we inherited in science, in science and that we keep reproducing, although unwittingly with on one side modernity epistemized by Europe and on the other tradition, if not backwardness, represented by Africa. I think the above quotation from uh, Shah Khabati also applies to our way of thinking and talking about language practices and linguistic ideologies. However, I don't believe that migration patterns within Africa differ stri strikingly from migrations elsewhere. Only some patterns are more prevalent in Africa. So the point I wish to drive here is that the scholarship on African migration, including that pertaining to language, can contribute greatly to linguistics and migration study in general by asking new research questions and contributing to new methodologies. So of course, I cannot keep talking uh, without uh, uh, grounding uh, my thinking and my analysis in ethnographic data. So I decided to focus on the work that has been conduct I've been conducting uh, in, in South Africa. So uh, the ethnographic and linguistic data on which the analysis was, were constructed from several field work conducted in Cape Town, South Africa over a protracted discontinuous period of 20 years. <coughs> the populations whose language practices are analyzed are black African migrants from former French and Belgian exploitation colonies. These migrants are part of intra-migration movements from the former French and Belgian African colonies that date back from the mid-1980s. So it's quite a recent uh, migration. Part of the South-to-South -South migration has been triggered by the steep decline of local African economies caused, caused among other things, by the drastic structural adjustment imposed on the economies of migrants' country by the World Bank and the IMF in the late 1980s that had destructive social and human consequences, among them the collapse of the education system, the destabilization of the labor market through the enforcement of free market, and I guess it rings a bell, in return, in return for debt rescheduling, the privatizing of the state assets, and by extension, the disengagement of the state in providing welfare and adequate social services to its population. In addition, the tightening of European migration policies, notably with the creation of the Schengen area in June 1990, has impacted the traditional migratory pathways between the former colonies and the metropoles, forcing African migrants to explore other routes, and South Africa is part of this new route um, that has been explored uh, since uh, the early 1990s. And I say 1990s because the 1980s migration is very uh, different from the 1990s, as I'm going to explain. So the new migratory trajectories have fostered new kinds of population contacts and therefore new language dynamics and practices. So, 
Uh, the, all my consultants are administratively categorized as, as asylum seekers or refugees. I choose not to use the institutional categories to define them for the reason I, I want to explain. Although these 80 categories may be useful in terms of policy making, it may not always be relevant for explaining dynamics of language contact and practices in migration complex settings. Moreover, I think they can obscure, obscure the latter if taken for granted. So I want to uh, illustrate my argument by uh, discussing the notion of the institutional category refugee, a category often used to describe migrants in and of sub-Saharan African countries, and now it's, uh, it's used a lot uh, to describe Syrian refugees in Europe. Um, and and the, the category refugee is pretty important uh, uh, for, for, to describe African migration because a, a very high proportion uh, of uh, migration on the African continent and elsewhere which actually constituted the people uh, uh, categorized as refugees. So although the category refugee captured the condition of the rich individuals or groups of population left their countries of origin and the lengthy and burdensome administrative procedure they were submitted uh, to at the receiving end of their geographic trajectory, it doesn't provide an explanatory framework for understanding the conditions, nature, and periodicity of population contacts. For instance, and I work in a, in a refugee camp uh, about 15 years ago in Cape Town, so you have refugees uh, who uh, reside in refugee camps, and refugee camps are often located uh, uh, in the, uh, the outskirts of a city or village, while others, uh, refugees, actually are scattered among the local populations. And my ethnographic work highlights the fact that the language practices of those cl classified as refugees uh, in, my, in my own world don't differ from those who are not. Their patterns of interactions, which are fundamental for us to understand, in order to understand you know, uh, the, the, the language dynamics, <clears throat> don't differ from those who are not classified as refugees. <clears throat> so their patterns of interactions are independent of their administrative status. And for instance, and it varies according to, to countries, for instance in South Africa, um, <clears throat> When you are a, a refugee, uh, you are allowed to seek employment or you are allowed to study. So one may argue, you know, because you have the status of, of refugee, uh, you may have a better access to local employment, you know. Uh, in, you know uh, unlike, for example, undocu undocumented migrants. And therefore you can, you know, think that because they have a refugee status, they have greater opportunities to interact, uh, interact with locals. But my work has shown that the reality on the ground shows that access to employment is often based on the social capital the migrant processes rather than a legal work permit. Therefore, I believe the analytical relevance for a linguist of the institutional categories refugee, undocumented migrant, economy migrant, and so on should always be assessed empirically rather than being posited. Okay, let's talk a bit about language. So, <clears throat> when I started my ethnographic work 20 years ago, I noticed my, that my consultants were always surprised when I asked them if they had been anxious to migrate to South Africa when not speaking English, nor any of the local languages. The usual answer I received from them was, une langue sans apprend, a language you learn it. They meant that one did not learn a language through classes, it is eventually acquired naturalistically through <coughs> regular interactions with its speakers. When reflecting on my question years later, I realized that my question was informed by my own experience as a migrant worker to Cape Town in 1994, for which I had prepared myself linguistically by buying English grammar books, vocabulary books, spending hours a day learning countless decontextualized words and phrasal verbs, and religiously reciting the list of irregular verbs. <laughs> my questioning reflected my literacy-based ideology of language learning, 
which was not the one by which all my consultants were operating. Multilingual speakers in Africa whose experience of language acquisition involving various indigenous languages has been pre predominantly naturalistic and who are used to operate in highly multilingual environments where they constantly have to adjust tend not to frame the lack of proficiency in the language of their new host language or languages of their new self environment as a potential barrier to their social or economic adjustment or as a prerequisite for operating in their new social cultural um, ecology. So my work shows that linguistic ideologies and linguistic habitus are two important factors according to which migrants construct their language learning trajectories on the ground. I believe the two should be articulated together as speakers always learn both a language and a relationship to a language and therefore the indexical values associated to it. Bourdieu's notion of linguistic habitus points to the generative principle that produces practices and therefore inscribe them in the history of their emergence, uh, development and adaptive deployment in a given context. Habitus is fundamentally about performance, as it shapes speakers' responses to the myriad, unpredictable contingencies of the moment. And as I will detail later, taking into account speakers' habitus has methodological and theoretical implications. So, my findings show a striking construct between the migrants who operate according to uh, learning, uh, what I call a learning adventure learning a language as a go principle, and those who choose to attend free ESL classes. So at the beginning, I'm going to talk about uh, a colonial, former colonial languages. So the latter group is primarily, so people who choose to attend ESL classes are predominantly uh, educated migrants who have been schooled the longest in their respective countries and have therefore internalized the idea that language in which they have been schooled and in this case French, is an asset for social economic mobility. So they think uh, that substituting English for French in the same way that the latter was acquired will give them a competitive hedge on the South African labor market. On the other hand, those who are less or non-educated have a more pragmatic approach to learning English. And I'm going to claim... Um, <coughs> We need to switch because we, I cannot use the mic and the sound at the same time. So the interview was done in French. Oui, tu sais, tu peux pas faire ceci parce que tu ne parles pas anglais. Tu peux pas, tu vois, il y a ces genres de barrières euh, qui, qui vont vraiment te retarder là. C'est un peu ça. Mais je pense que c'était juste un problème de milieu. Parce que j'ai vu des gens venir ici. Bah, pas pour moi avec un bon niveau d'anglais pour travailler. Hein. Ouais. Donc, moi, on était un peu du genre un peu retardé, un peu. Ouais. Bon, on me dit, ouais, c'est pas le moment, vous êtes trop pressé, prendre votre temps, il faut bien apprendre la langue, et puis voilà. Ok, so this is the case of Ben, who explained how the company told him that he should first learn English for, before looking for a job. And Ben's own experience, he found a job not too long after he arrived, and his assessment of the situation on the ground. Uh, brought him to challenge the advice and receive. And what is very interesting <coughs> is that uh, a lot of this ideology circulates within the migrant community. So people, when you arrive, people will tell you, it, it's like they, they lay out a plan for you of what you are potentially, what potentially you should be doing, what kind of work you should uh, be doing. That's why when you, I, I worked with people coming from 12 national communities and that's why you see you know, people working in the same kind, having the same kind uh, line of work because they, many of them don't explore other, other opportunities. So, uh, many of the migrants who adopt a learners you go strategy, uh, like Ben, tend to reframe their participation uh, in South African social gatherings as an English learning process. And uh, during my several months volunteering as a French-English interpreter in the trauma center for African refugees in Cape Town, 
I used to ask the patients about their motivation to attend the bi-weekly group therapy <coughs> sessions and the psychological benefits they withdrew from them. To my astonishment, many responded that they came to learn English, as they were provided simultaneous French-English and English-French translations during the sessions. They displayed little interest in the therapeutic exercise that they say was very foreign to them, but recognized that group therapy, the group uh, therapy interactional setting as a unique language learning opportunity. And so the same learning dynamics also apply in uh, Congolese Pentecostal churches in which I conducted a very long ethnographic uh, work that offer bilingual French English and Lingala English services. Although congregants don't primarily attend church services to get exposed to English, many recast their participation also as an English learning experience thanks to the interpreting activity. So I want again to play Ben. So, uh, what is interesting in, in this excerpt is even <coughs> they will use this uh, participation in, in social gathering as, a, as an English uh, learning uh, process, even in activities, in work activities that really don't require much uh, 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 social interaction. And this is the case of Ben again who works as a trolley boy. Meaning, you know, just pushing trolleys. And then, how many tickets? Sound on push. Ah, yes. On the push, we have to be too big, boy. It's that. 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 It's Voilà, du coup, je me suis entraîné rapidement à parler avec eux, euh, à demander. So, such language learning dynamics, which I believe are not restricted to Africa or Africans, raise two important points. First, it prompts us to reconsider the overwhelmingly literacy based perspective on migrants' language acquisition in our scholarship and to account for what I call the serendipity of language acquisition. In this case, serendipity. Uh, involves speakers' proactivity and creativity in transforming any social event or interactional activity into a language learning process. From a methodological point of view, it involves documenting and assessing migrants' any construction of these spaces. And in order to, to do so, we field workers should also, also apply serendipity by exploring gray alleys and uncharted paths and remaining constantly surprised by new observations <coughs> and open to new explanations. Second, my South African findings also question the fee-for-all response most generally provided by governments and NGOs for migrants' acquisitions of the language or languages of their host country. Although literacy-based and decontextualized language learning classes may, may be well adapted uh, for some migrants, they may not be the most beneficial responses uh, for others. So the problem arises when attendance of these classes are, is made mandatory as part of the binding contract between the migrant and the host country, as done in the case of France, but I'm sure it applies in, in, in your respective countries. So here I step out of Africa for a while to address issues some African migrants face when they find themselves trapped in the European immigration institutional maze. So, <clears throat> in the French contrat d'intégration, which migrants are asked to sign upon their arrival, language learning classes are initially presented as a right you will be entitled to. A few lines later, this right is reframed into an obligation you make a commitment. Literacy is not only part of the language training, but is also used for assessing the migrant's language acquisition. The use of literacy in this context is just one example of how the latter has increasingly become a requirement for entry to a growing range of opportunities and services, not just for migrants, but also local workers and welfare recipients. 
Coming back to my earlier point on the categories of thoughts imposed by the state, the distinction between migrants and locals <coughs> would prevent us from analyzing the use of literacy in language learning classes for immigrants as part of broader dynamics of social exclusion as documented by critical uh, literacy scholars. Indeed, literacy tests have been required variously as a condition for registering for an employment agency, getting into a training program, applying for social assistance, and receiving unemployment insurance. While language and literacy may not be experienced by individuals as a problem in the routine conduct of their lives in their host ecology, a decontextualized and literacy-based assessment of what counts as language acquisition is made to matter by powerful interests such as governments and employers. Worth noting is that the French uh, uh, DILF test, uh, uh, initial diploma in French, was launched at the request of the French Ministry of Employment, illustrating how government have been mainly thinking of migrants in terms of <coughs> power upon to which I come later. So in France, not only the failure to perform the test may result in exclusion, but also the failure to attend mandatory language training or complete the program may engender termination of migrants who no stay on the national territory. <coughs> so to my knowledge, no such formalized literacy requirement exists in sub-Saharan Africa. In Cape Town, it's very hard to assess whether the migrants who learn English in ESL schools better thrive economically than those who didn't. My fieldwork showed that on the South African job market, the migrants cannot rely openly on the institutional notion of linguistic capital to be very competitive. Although they are hard to assess, multiple overlapping factors bear on my interview with work trajectory, and language might not be the most important one, as I illustrate now. So it's not that I like Ben particularly, but he was the one who was really... <laughs> So I'm going to play again, um, and you see that's a very cheerful uh, encounter. Après vous devez vous présenter chez Spa, et Spa en anglais, le mot Spa peut être en portugais. Mais vous voyez, on a vu qu'un top now, I can feel a French man as he is. But you don't speak English very well, as he is. Yeah, but I'll give you a chance. Okay? I understand. I want you to be able to get the right job. I don't care about it if you don't speak English very well. Yeah, okay, fine. Il m'a donné un contrat de trois mois. Il m'a dit je vais te voir comment tu vas travailler après ça m'a donné ici. Et du coup, euh, dès que j'ai commencé à travailler, c'était vraiment facile, tu vois, le milieu. J'ai commencé à parler anglais, je me forçais tout le temps après tout, c'est parti. Et il m'a donné un contrat déterminé. So, a deeply entrenched. Assumption in the literature of migration is the correlation between migrants' competence in the host country's language and languages and their likelihood of being inserted in its economic system. In other words, the migrants who speak or learn the language of their social uh, economy ec ecology well, and I do it on purpose, are presumably more competitive on the local job market than those who do not. And the vast majority of the quantitative studies that economists conducted again on Europe, the US, Australia, and Israel corroborate this correlation. Worth noting is that economists' general conclusion rests on a narrow geographic <coughs> subset of linguistic situations of the global north. Rather than reflecting their Western bias, this limited geographic scope points to the lack of re uh, reliable. Uh, relevant, reliable data in many parts of the world, challenging the quest for generality that is a permanent, almost obsessive concern of economic analysis. Their conclusions on the significance of the migrant competence in the host country's language for the purpose of uh, economic integration have been largely embraced by policymakers of the North and by supranational agencies. These findings have given a scientific stamp on the studious and biased and apolitical to use language testing in order to regulate populations, mobility across nations, which uh, with states capitalizing on it to assert their sovereignty. 
As I will show in the social linguistic literature language has become, has become a key component of the global uh, mobility regime. So before challenging the assumed corre the straightforward correlation between language competence and economic uh, integration, I want to make a detour by stressing the long relationship economies have entertained with policymakers in charge of migration issues. I believe that this brief historical background can shed light on economists' interest in migrants' host language proficiency and the resonance of their work on policymakers. Economists played an instrumental role in fulfilling the migration policy mandate given to the International Labour <coughs> Organization, ILO, at the end of World War I in order to regulate the massive exodus of our refugees across Europe and to the United States. Among their tasks was the development of an international standard classification of occupation whose aim was to produce comparative statistical data of workers across countries and provide governments a template for recruiting foreign labor and managing short and long term migration. Economic early involvement in migration policy reflects the ways in which migration has been pre 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 sorry, predominantly framed since that time as an economy and therefore political matter, with governments of the North constructing migrants primarily, if not exclusively, as economic actors and mind power, rather than full-fledged participants in a host polity. So, economic straightforward correlation between language competence and employment frames languages <coughs> as both the problem and the solution to migrants, integration. According to this line of thought, the acquisition of the host language is treated as a migrant uh, effort and willingness, while socio-economic integration is believed to be of their sole responsibility. So, <clears throat> treating language as human capital as economies do rest on the ideological assumption that language can be treated as an autonomy system whose, social, whose economic competence for an individual can be derived from it from its intrinsic nature. Such framing tends to construct social agents as rich, rational language users or learners, the languages they speak as non-indexical, and the labor, the labor market in which they operate as race, gender, and ethnicity free, equally accessible to everybody providing they have the right skills, including language. As long documented by social linguists, we actually did um, and others, not me, uh, race, ethnicity, and gender are axes of inequality along which societies operate, with language playing a key role in the production of social economic discrimination. The, the critical assessment of the non straightforward correlation between language competence and social economic insertion does not dispute the importance of language in the migrants' access to services and resources provided in the host society. Indeed, those who do not command the host language or languages or, or who lack a local system support that would compensate for it are likely to be more subjected to various local forms of exploitation, including from other migrants. And I've documented that. that Exploitation is actually linguistic exploitation also <coughs> occur uh, within migrant, uh, migrant communities. This observation simply underscores a non negligible counterpoint to the widely shared assumption that a migrant's lack of competence in the main languages of their host economy impedes their social and economic um, emancipation. <coughs> so, <coughs> the questions I want to ask is to what extent. The correlation between language competence and economic integration based on formalized economic system with highly regulated labor markets reflect African migrants' experience in the overwhelmingly informal and I tend not to use the notion of informal economy, I prefer um, to talk about vernacular economies of the continent. Is the ideology of the standard that may impede non-native speakers, and, and I use non-native uh, in the <coughs> access to jobs in European and American contexts relevant to African settings where the dominant language of the main economy, and in this case English, is overwhelmingly spoken as a second or third 
language by the local population. So none of my consultants in Cape Town, in Cape Town had any career plan before they came to South Africa. The narrative will be complex work trajectories constructed and above all serendipity. I never asked language-related questions when I prompted my interviewees to narrate their work trajectories. And that may sound very strange uh, when you are linguist. But um, I was interested in the emergence of language-related discourse or lack thereof when recounting their work experiences. I wanted to see in the ways in which they, they recount their work trajectory, the, the ways in which they make sense of their work uh, trajectories is actually a uh, shape around uh, issues of language. So one striking contrast emerging from the interview was how the educated migrants were more likely to rationalize this, their misfortunes on the local job market by invoking their lack of oral or written proficiency in English compared to those of the migrants with no institutional cultural capital. One may argue here that, unlike the, the, their non-educated counterparts, educated migrants are likely to compete for jobs that require English proficiency and therefore feel a greater pressure to acquire this language of the dominant economy. Although it may well be the case, uh, <clears throat> but I believe it's only part, only part of the story. Without underestimating the effect of language competence on the migrant social economic ability, I suggest we analyze this discourse also as part of language ideologies that educated speakers have internalized through the school system. Okay? <coughs> and it's very clear, uh, as I said earlier, that uh, uh, if, for, for those who have been educated, they really think that uh, 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 speaking English will, will help them assess, uh, will help them climb the social economic ladder. Uh, and that's actually what happens in the case of French, although you still have this ideology, although French in many, many uh, former uh, French or Belgian exploitation, African exploitation colonies don't help you anymore to climb. Uh, 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 the social economic ladder, but what remains is this idea that it will help you. So there is a clear disjunction in equating language as a symbolic capital with language as an economic capital, as the conversion rate from one form of capital to the other appears to be very low. <clears throat> Worth noting is that the migrants' perception of English as an economic capital also vary according to their exposure to the local labor market and duration of their stay in the host country. And I interview um, among the over 200 form formal interviews I did, I interviewed people who had just arrived. So I interviewed them a day after they arrived. And I interviewed people who had been in the country for two, three, four uh, to 15 years. So I've got a very broad range uh, of, of people's experience. So those who have not yet been directly confronted with the harsh local labor market, such as the self-employed or the freshly arrived migrants, tend to see the acquisition of English as an asset in South Africa and as a sine qua non condition for finding a job. Interestingly, similar discourses are also constructed on French. Thanks to their competence in the language, many believe they can work as tourist guides, clerks in hotels, French teachers. None of the French-speaking African waiters and cooks in, in international hotels have interviewed have, has ever been asked if they could speak any other European languages. None of them believe that their competence in another European language was crucial for landing a job. And I, I talk about European languages because uh, African languages have a very uh, low economic um, uh, capital uh, in formalized uh, economic um, system. So those who applied of Alliance Francaise having application turned down in favor of European French speakers. So on the contrary, those who experience difficulties to access job or who have been underemployed tend to rationalize their misfortune by invoking their reject re rejection as African foreigners. 
Competence in English is therefore not perceived by the particular opener to employment. It is hard to know to what extent people who have been there from jobs based on the fact that they are non-locals, especially in an economy where the national unemployment rate is close to 30%. So I'm not much interested here in the accuracy of the migrant statement on the correlation or lack thereof between language proficiency and success in finding a job, which I have no way of assessing. Rather, I focus on the discursive construction of this correlation. <clears throat> I believe an analysis on new speaker reason must address equally what drives some speakers to acquire, to acquire or, on the contrary, not to acquire a language or languages in a given uh, ecology. It is equally important to examine, for, inter for instance, why my interviewer, the interviewees, Choose not to let me see Persa or Africans, the two other main languages in Cape Town besides <coughs> English. In the interest of time, I leave this aspect aside in order to focus on an important dimension that has been underexplored in the scholarly literature, namely the social and linguistic dynamics that lead migrants to acquire a new lingua franca from their homelands in their host country. In the literature on language and migration, great emphasis has been put on migrants' acquisition of their host languages and on their language attrition and loss, framing the migratory experience as putting in danger speakers' vernacular or vehicular languages. <coughs> Following Mufwene in 2001-2008, who argues that language change or shift within a population reflects the accumulation of individual speakers' choice during specific communicative acts, I now examine ethnographically the social and economic reasons that, that drive non-legal families of people who didn't speak Lingala, which is one of the main uh, 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 Congolese uh, vehicular uh, languages. So I want to see why people who didn't speak Lingala in the Congo uh, and other migrants coming from other African countries where uh, Lingala is not spoken is actually they learn the language uh, in, in, the, um, <coughs> in, the new, uh, in the new setting. So I want to understand uh, what, what, are, what drives uh, the fact that people start learning Lingala in South Africa. So in the mid-2000, uh, during one of my fieldworks, I became aware of the spread of Lingala among Congolese migrants who didn't speak it prior to their arrival in Cape Town. This was a significant shift from the mid-1990s, where only a few Lingala words to name certain endogenous practices were circulating outside the community of first language speakers, the Quinoa. So Quinoa are people from Kinshasa. This index of centrifugal influence exerted in some not always legal domains by quinoa entrepreneurs in Cape Town. For instance, <coughs> legal phone businesses set up by hijacking regular telephone lines were called sumbela, meaning having a running stomach, or it's actually more verbal, it's like cheating without, without stopping. Um, <laughs> So, the, the, these irregular telephone lines were called Sumbela, the other word Sumbela, by anybody from the migrant communities who was using this service, including me. So, if this entrepreneurship had remained confined to shady activities, as was often the case in the late 1990s, Lingala may not have thrived as much as it has in Cape Town. So, this evolution must be also inserted in the broader history of the Congolese migration from DRC to South Africa, which had proceeded in several ways since the mid-1990s. Significant demographic changes have taken place over the years. In the mid-1990s, a third wave of Congolese arrived in South Africa following the collapse of the education system and that of the economy. Because they were far less educated than those of the first and second wave, many of them barely spoke French. Yet these new comments, comments had developed social and economic skills that were immediately trans 
transferable in their new South African ecology. Having grown up in the vernacular economy of Kinshasa, they had developed survival strategies which involved a very high degree of entrepreneurship. The economy of predation, that is referred to by some economists, has pervaded all the strata of the Congolese society from the top of the state to the bottom strata. La débrouillardise of System D, as it is referred to in Kinshasa, is encapsulated by what is commonly referred as Article 15, the 15th unwritten amendment of the Congolese constitution. Débrouillez-vous, vous êtes à la maison. Find for yourself, you're at home. That can be summed up as make whatever opportunities arise, arise to avoid starvation. So when, asked, when I ask people how do they, they get by on a daily basis, I, I hardly ask people, you know, what kind of job do you do? Uh, uh, because uh, I realize that we don't have the same, we don't share the same definition of what, you know, what constitutes a job. Uh, so usually I say, you know, what, what, how you do, do you get by uh, on a daily basis? And often my consultant in Cape Town answer in a slightly amusing, enigmatic way, but still I'm Congolese. <laughs> <laughs> so the category Congolese in this context no longer indexes a place of origin but a way of living. For those people, vernacular economy is not a choice by default, simply because they, are, they aren't enough employment opportunities in South Africa. It is an adaptation of their economic behavior in their homelands to their new social economic environment. So therefore, the economic field in which many quinoa operate cannot be separated from their economic habitus, and again, that's why we do here, they acquired in Kinshasa. Thanks to La Debu, the quinoa in Cape Town develops small to medium scale businesses such as selling cigarettes on the street, braiding hair, operating internet cafes, and managing a trolley service. For those <coughs> economies, this practice becomes a resource for action, setting up a business, and to some extent a source of power, controlling who gets employed or not. <coughs> As it operates in Lingala and generates source of income for its member, non-Lingala from Congolese or other migrants feel the pressure to acquire the language and have access to the jobs it offers. Because there is no institutional process of recruitment in vernacular economy, the linguistic capital one processes is crucial for landing a job. Indeed, Social networks play a crucial role in getting informed about job vacancy, especially in an economic system where job advertising is mostly circulated by word of mouth. Note that the acquisition of this linguistic capital in Gala depends on the social capital one possesses, as the language can only be acquired naturalistically by interacting regularly with its speakers. And you see how in this context, a social capital can be converted into a linguistic capital. So the acquisition of Ligala generally occurs at home when migrants share rooms uh, to cut housing costs. And they, you often have uh, single, uh, single people, so they, they share uh, houses and, and rooms in order to cut uh, their housing costs. Or uh, Ligala is acquired the workplace. And uh, we also need to rethink the, the notion, the dynamics of the workplace um, in, in informal economy, at least what I've, I've noticed. Uh, because the workplace is often a setting of intense socialization, where other quinoa people from Kinshasa come and go all day long and chat with the business owners, his employees who are busy working like uh, in a body shop. I, I conducted the ethnography in a body shop in Cape Town. And you know, you see, I mean, it's, it's uh, people are working, but actually it's always full of people coming, interacting. And at some point I, I met this guy from, um, from Benin and I heard him speak uh, Lingala. I said, oh, wow. Uh, oh, so you speak Lingala? I say, yeah. And I say, oh, okay, well, how did you get to speak Lingala? You're not supposed to, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and he said, well, you know, I just, work here and I'm surrounded by Ligala and you know, and you pick it up, that's it. I mean, he found my question actually very stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. So the adoption of Lingala by non-Lingala uh, 
Linda Lafontaine values reflect the change of the indexical values of the language in the context of migration. Whereas in DRC, non quinoa people who are not from Kinshasa, tend to despise Lingala as a language associated with the bad lifestyle of its speakers living in Kinshasa. In Cape Town, it has come to index potential social economic emancipation in the local job market. And uh, so what I find interesting is what triggers <coughs> the, you know, uh, the vitality, the emergence of, of Lingala in Kinshasa is exactly what triggers the spread of Lingala in Cape Town. Um, uh, so there is a grassroots both in Kinshasa and in Cape Town, there is a grassroots social pressure to adopt Lingala. Uh, even, you know, in Kinshasa by white-collar workers uh, who were before very proud to speak French and now they, because they have to engage in the vernacular economy because a university professor is not paid on a regular basis so they have, you know, to engage also in the vernacular economy they also have the pressure to uh, actually learn Lingala. So, findings such as mine call for in, an integrative approach, I call it an integrative approach uh, for lack of a better word, to language practice in the context of migration, a context where language use can be conceived as a continuum of practices along the social and geographic trajectories and not as disconnected from previous language practices. Although this position corroborates the idea that language practices in the context of migration are adaptive responses to the local, eco the local ecology. The integrative approach emphasizes the fact that the responses are not constructed independently of speakers' previous communicative practices. The integrative approach makes it possible to historicize migrants' language practices and therefore better understand the impact of the new host environment on the social and economic habits acquired prior to migration. Such a perspective implies that the context of migration should be reassessed and not posited a priori as the main, if, if not the only, uh, uh, the only explanatory factor in, uh, in shaping people's practices. And I think it, it, it also prompts us to rethink the dichotomy between host and uh, home country with which migration has been framed primarily in terms of this juncture and difference. And I, actually what I'm, I'm trying to advocate for is, is really looking at it as also uh, a continuity. So not looking you know, in a dichotomic way they would be the host, uh, you know, the host uh, environment and the home environment, but as a continuity of practice. The spread of Lingala in Cape Town as well is straight the need to factor um, uh, to factor in the role of an accurate economy to explain migrants' adoption of a new language in a host country. The greatest part of the scholarship on language economy and migration has focused almost exclusively, and I'm very generous, on highly formalized economic practices. As, in, uh, as, is, uh, as illustrated by the following graph, informal economy represents a non-negligible part of national economies and therefore a substantial amount of workers. And I intentionally choose to display the list of all OECD member countries as informal economy tends to be associated overwhelmingly with, with countries from the global south. I believe we should refrain from endorsing government's discursive construction of informal economy as outlaw practices. Although it may involve illegal activities such as drug smuggling, black market, prostitution, and counterfeit, it would be misleading to reduce it to criminal activities. Such a discourse partakes of the criminalization of migrants and of itself to justify the harshening of immigration policies. Because I believe it is an important part of migrants' pathways of incorporation. And I I use uh, Schiller and uh, Segal's 2014 notion of pathways of incorporation. I really believe that even in Europe and North America, uh, 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 vernacular economy is, is really an important part of migrants' pathway of incorporation into their whole society. I believe that it deserves our attention. So here are a few questions, and I, and I, I won't go uh, through it. Because 
because I'm running a little bit out of time and I want to get to the fun part, I mean the last fun part. So what should be in mind, bear in mind that issues of language and migration should not only focus on the restructuring of migrant communicative repertoires, but also take into account that of members of the host population who are in contact with the migrants. To my knowledge, little work has been done on this facet of immigration. And I want to uh, show you uh, how Lingala has been spreading among young black female South African <coughs> character. And like many of the African counterparts, Senegalese, Malian, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and Nigerians, the young Quinoa people from Kinshasa have been highly visible in Cape Town nightlife. Filling the nightclubs and cafe on Long Street, the heart of Cape Town club life, and dancing on Congolese beat at Chilitanga, a Congolese owned nightclub. <clears throat> These young, well dressed, and often flashy men have become highly praised dating material for some segments of the young black South African population who have learned how to dance dongolo and other trendy Congolese dances. Sustained interaction and desire to associate with the kind of life this young urbanized embody have led some of these women to acquire Lingala. Gender dynamics seems to play a significant part in socialization and by extension language acquisition. On the other hand, my ethnographic fieldworks finding a set 20 discontinuous years show Congolese women's strong reluctance to associate romantically with black South African men. They actually, in 20 years, I've never ever met any uh, Congolese couples where uh, the, woman would be, the woman would be Congolese and, 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 and uh, the guy would be um, um, black South African. So the role of gender and sexuality in fostering language spread in Africa and elsewhere at the societal and individual levels, and I think it really deserves our attention at a time when female migration is on the rise, not only on the continent, but everywhere else uh, in, um, in the world. <coughs> Conclusion. <coughs> By the very presence in a host land, migrants embody complex and multidimensional geographical, political, economic, historical, linguistic, uh, historical relations between countries. However, one shouldn't dissociate the migrants too hastily from their agency and depict them as passive experiences of broader historical dynamics. And that's one of the problems I have with a lot of work that has been done on migration uh, with uh, migrants, uh, I think, be, being deprived of, a, of their agency. They are looked at as somebody who are passive and experienced uh, broader historical dynamics. I believe that any reflection on migration should always be articulated with, with that on the ways in which mobility is constructed and discursively articulated by migrants and their host communities. Our understanding of language practices of African migrants moving within the continent is still very partial due to limitations and the lack of reliable data, the fact that many African languages have not been described, the fact that we still operate according to, uh, in, in many countries, to colonial descriptions of, of African languages. So there are many <coughs> issues uh, that, uh, you know, limitation that prevents us from really uh, having a, a good understanding of, of the dynamics on the, on the continent. Although the case examined here does not allow for any pan-African generalizations, it helps us raise a number of important theoretical and methodolo methodological issues that can fruitfully contribute to the scholarship on language and migration. And for example, the use of institutional categories, the question of the other emphasis on literacy, etc. The heterogeneity emerging from the analysis of microlanguage practice, such as the one I presented, uh, here always reminds us to resist hasty and simplistic explanations that claim to be unified accounts of dynamic behaviors that are otherwise complex and variable. Yet, micro scale studies should, study should not let us lose sight of broader time and space scales of language dynamics. I hope that my presentation aroused the 
interest of some of you working on south to north migration and make you aware of the theoretical and methodological significance of scholarship on migration produced on and in the south. It should help us reshape, I hope, the academic discourse, making it more inclusive and hopefully a monument. Thank you.